Second reading of the 2021 budget passed in Parliament. 151 in favour, 52 against. Residents of Colombo staged protests citing lack of relief. 5,000 rupee allowance was not given to spend in a week, says Minister Vimal Virawansa in Parliament. <laughs> Can schools recommence on the 23rd? Sri Lanka born Dr. Ramasamy's role as an investigator in Oxford COVID-19 vaccine group. Hello there, a very good evening and welcome to Primetime News on TV1. On to your top story tonight, a group of residents of Alutmavata in Colombo 15 took to the streets today claiming that the concessions granted to them during the lockdown period are insufficient. The protest was staged in an area that has been declared as an area under lockdown. Fourteen days have lapsed since Alut Mavata in Colombo 15 was placed under isolation. Over 300 people took to the streets today and protested, stating that the concessions granted to them are insufficient. We live on a daily wage. When this area was closed down this time, what were we supposed to do? Are we to die of hunger in our homes? Allow us to earn our daily wages. The government is giving us 5,000 rupees and washing off their hands. Both the government and the opposition needs to look into this matter. If four people are living in one house, even 1,000 rupees is not enough for them to eat. 5,000 rupees will be enough for a few days. How can we eat for a month with 5,000 rupees? We have been placed under lockdown for a month now. Today the police came and told us to stay in our homes for another 14 days. This time, however, we did not receive any concessions. The day before yesterday, we got 5,000 rupees. The people in our village earn a daily wage. Giving us 5,000 rupees is not enough. Give us a hamper. Our children are hungry. We don't have any food. SSP in charge of Colombo North, Nihal Dehidenia, arrived at the scene and attempted to calm the protesters down. He requested the protesters to place their trust in him and to return to their homes. Following the intervention of the SSP, the protesters dispersed. <laughs> Meanwhile, views were expressed about the people who have been impacted by the prevailing COVID-19 situation. People in Colombo North and Central Colombo have taken to the streets, saying that they have no food or water. They say that they have been confined to their homes for more than a month. The 5,000 rupee allowance was not given to spend within a week. All of them have been given that concession and now they are saying that they do not have anything after spending all of it. The allowance has been distributed among a large number of people. There is no possibility of us distributing this by asking people to stand in queues in the current situation. So we are doing the best that we can. But by people stepping out to the streets, the spread of the virus will intensify and we will have to impose lockdowns in those areas. 
We did not persuade anyone to take to the streets. They have voluntarily come out of their homes. They claim that they have nothing to eat or drink. That is why you have been brought to the parliamentary complex today. We want to see people undergoing tests, whether it is a PCR or antigen. Let us worry about the country's economy later. Let us first worry about the domestic economy. Today we were able to control what happened. In the future, we might not be able to control this. I would like to bring this to your attention. <laughs> I would like to sincerely inform the opposition leader that it is not suitable to present a statement that is related to COVID-19 in Parliament now. Once you restricted the 27th stroke to saying that it is only eligible for twice a week. I have never asked this particular question. Are you trying to take away our right to question as well? You said that you did not receive answers to three of your questions. Minister Channa Jayasumana gave a comprehensive answer to one of your questions. Minister Namal Rajapaksa answered your question regarding the vaccine. All of these were telecast on television. During the time of the war, we spoke about the war at the parliamentary complex for years. COVID-19 is not right. The situation changes daily. Because of that, we have a right to ask questions about COVID-19. You cannot say that we cannot ask questions because we posed questions last week. No. This is the 27 stroke 2 question. Are you trying to bring forth new laws to cover up the inability of the government? Do we not bear the right to question about this vaccine? <laughs> you cannot make your own decisions we understand your mentality you are merely repeating what minister Namal Rajapaksa said we can see who is giving you instructions Please safeguard the honor of the parliament. Please do not deprive the right of the opposition leader. Travel restrictions were imposed to the Atalugama village in Bandaragama this morning following the detection of 17 COVID-19 cases. These cases were identified during random PCR tests that were conducted by the Bandaragama Medical Officers of Health yesterday. Our correspondent said that barricades have been placed in six entry points to Atalugama village. Officers of several police stations, including the Bandaragama police, have been placed for duties at roadblocks. Steps were also taken to close down shops that were operated by the COVID-19 patients identified from the Horan town. Two hundred and fifty seven COVID nineteen cases were identified in the islands today. They were all linked to the Paligoda cluster. The total number of COVID nineteen cases in the country increased to nineteen thousand five hundred and thirty seven. Three hundred and nineteen patients were discharged today after making a full recovery. The epidemiology unit of the Ministry of Health said that the total number of patients who made a full recovery stands at thirteen thousand five hundred and ninety. 5,873 patients are receiving treatment in hospitals. The COVID-19 death toll in Sri Lanka stands at 74. Is there a decision to import a COVID-19 vaccine? 
We have not reached a final decision on the vaccine. Last week, we appointed a technical committee chaired by the secretary to the ministry to look into the matter. The technical committee will meet again next week. There are a number of vaccines that are in the trial phases across the world. Therefore, we have not reached a final decision on the matter. We will examine all of this data and reach a final decision. The World Health Organization has said that they can provide the vaccine to 20% of the Sri Lankan population. We don't know what kind of vaccine they are providing us. But before doing any of that, we need to take a decision as the Health Department of Sri Lanka based on the assessment of the technical committee. The Ministry of Education on the 19th of this month decided to reopen schools in the country, excluding schools in the western province and areas that have been placed under lockdown. However, Teachers Association and several other factions pointed out that this decision needs to be reviewed. Minister GLP said that the discussion to recommence classes for students from grades 6 to 13 was reached after extensive discussions were held with senior teachers and principals. We do not know who he held discussions with. If the schools are to be reopened, the premises must be disinfected. Tomorrow is Sunday, so when are they going to do this? Holidays for the final term will begin on the 2nd of December. There are only four weeks left until then. They are proposing to bring students in batches if there are over 30 students per class. So according to those calculations, a student will only receive education for two weeks during this period. We must also point out that this online program is unsuccessful. The students who are going to sit for their ordinary level examination on the 18th of January must be informed on which areas of their syllabi they will be questioned on. A decision has also been reached to close schools in the districts of Colombo, Gampa, Kalutara and in other areas that have been placed under lockdown. What are the steps that will be taken regarding those students? <laughs> We reached this decision after holding discussions with everyone. That is why we decided not to reopen the schools in the western province where the spread of this virus is very high. Out of the 435 patients that were reported yesterday, most of them are from the western province. We have identified their close associates. I believe we have analyzed the situation based on the epidemiological protocols and reached this decision. We need to understand that we will not be able to announce the date on which the schools will be reopened if we wait until the virus is completely eradicated. So after we get the spread of the virus under some control, we believe that we can reopen methodically. <laughs> You cannot base these decisions on dreams you see at night. There was a proper plan for reopening schools the last time. First, the teachers were brought to school. Then, students in grades 13, 12 and 11 were brought to school. After that, schools were reopened gradually. But nothing like that is being done now. There is a high risk of children contracting this disease while on their way to school and back. If a COVID-19 cluster emerges from a school, the officials must be held accountable. The All Ceylon Inter-District School Transport Services Union said that concessions must be provided to them to transport students to schools while adhering to health guidelines. <laughs> The regulation states that children can be transported only at 50% capacity. We will have to charge all of the children travelling in our vehicles, even though we can carry only 50%. The government gave us a concession. That is not a concession. It was like getting struck by a bull after falling off a tree. We are also facing issues in getting our vehicles disinfected before we transport these students, given our current financial situation. The State Minister of Transport spoke about the steps taken to transport students. 
Sisun Pamanak Prohan Ekiri Musandara. We have prepared an SLTB and private bus plan to transport students to schools. A committee has been appointed under the chairmanship of the zonal directors. The SLTB regional managers and members from the private passenger transport authority have been appointed to this committee. All of them sit in this committee. We have permitted the number of buses deployed to transport students to be increased subject to the approval of the superintendent of the depot and the regional manager if the zonal director decides that the number of buses are insufficient. <laughs> COVID-19 cases reported from prisons across the country have increased to 617. According to Commissioner of Prisons in Charge of Administration, Rehabilitation and Skills Development, Chandan Ekanayaka, 578 of them are reported to be inmates and 39 of them are prison officials. The most number of cases have been reported from the Valikari prison. The figure stands at 236. 170 cases from the Bogambara prison, 120 cases from the Columbariman prison, 49 from the Busa prison and 16 cases have been reported from the Kuruvita prison. 11 inmates who were tested positive for the virus have been admitted to hospitals for treatment. Inmates and prison officials who have tested positive for COVID-19 are currently receiving treatment at treatment centers in Gallala, Valikanda, Kandakadu and at the prison hospital located in Valikada. The prison's commissioner in charge of administration, rehabilitation and skills development, Chandanekanak, said that two prison officials and 26 prison inmates have recovered from the virus as of now. Meanwhile, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka announced that one of its employees tested positive for COVID-19 on the 19th of November 2020. According to the CBSL, its essential operations will continue as usual. Issuing a communique, the central bank stated that it will follow stringent infection prevention guidelines to protect its staff and the visiting public as the bank considers ensuring their safety as a top priority. The race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine is intensifying. Many countries, pharmaceutical corporations and leading universities have developed candidate vaccines which have proven to be highly effective, meaning that a successful curative process for COVID-19 is not too far away. The University of Oxford gains much credit among the institutions that are engaged in developing a vaccine for COVID-19. Now, incidentally, Sri Lankan board consultant physician Dr. Maheshi Ramasamy is one of the principal investigators in the Oxford vaccine group. Dr. Ramasamy, who was born in Sri Lanka, completed her medical education in the United Kingdom. Her name has been highlighted a number of times in an article published on The Lancet, a world-renowned medical journal which reports on the clinical progress of the vaccine that is being developed to counter COVID-19. Dr. Ramasamy obtained her medical degree at Christ's College, University of Cambridge, and trained in infectious diseases and general internal medicine in London and Oxford. She is currently a consultant consultant physician at the Oxford University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust and also serves as a principal lecturer at Megan Medical College. Dr. Ramasamy's parents too are illustrious scientists. Her mother, Professor Samaranayaka Ramasamy, is celebrated as the first ever Sri Lankan to receive a PhD from the University of Cambridge, while her father, Ranjan Ramasamy, was a scientist. We're up to date on the COVID-19 situation in Sri Lanka and of course on the possibility of getting a vaccine for the virus quite soon. Moving on to other local news, the second reading of the 2021 budget was passed by a majority of 99 votes in Parliament today. 151 votes were cast in favour while 52 votes were cast against. Pakshava Chanda Ekasia Panas Ekai, Yuruddava Chanda Panas Dekai, Eanu, 
Ouais, ben, je connais ça, mon tête. Non. Parliamentarians representing the opposition warn that the country is headed towards an insurmountable debt crisis. Speaking during the budget debate in Parliament today, leader of the Jathika Jana Balavegia, Andrukumara Desa Naika, expressed the following views. The crisis our country's economy is facing is fivefold. The COVID-19 crisis has accentuated an ailing economy. This first issue is production has halted. Secondly, state revenue has dwindled. State revenue has fallen by 24% compared to the first nine months of 2019. State expenditure for 2021 is expected to be 4.991 trillion, while income is 1.994 trillion. The state only recovers 39% of its expenditure. In 2020, state expenditure was 4.718 trillion, while revenue was 1.55 trillion. While we earn 28 cents, we have to spend 100 cents. The other issue is the deficit in the balance of payments. There is a shortage of nearly $8 billion. The fourth concern is the debt crisis. If state revenue is insufficient to service debt and a further $299 billion of loans should be obtained what more are we to speak of this economy the treasury is running on an overdraft of nearly 500 billion state banks have provided these funds out of the total loans handed out by the people's bank a large chunk is obtained by the treasury and another is obtained by state entities 274 billion of state loans have been obtained through the people's bank 381 billion have been obtained through the boc the main debtor in the country right now is the government and state corporations. They are playing around with bank interests to benefit the government. They reduce it to 4% so that the government can benefit. The other issue is income disparity. The rural populace does not receive the due incomes. What solution do you intend to provide for these five issues? One is laundering money. Who is holding this money? The fisherman or the farmer? No. You have the money which you looted over the years. Drug kinpins and ethanol importers have stacks of black money. The government wants the black money laundered and injected into the economy and are allowing it to be injected at a nominal value of 1%. In India, notes with new designs were printed to counter the black money from being injected. But you want the money laundered. As we all know, the Titanic sank for more than two hours after it struck the iceberg. The band of the Titanic played all the while. Honorable Speaker, in the context of our economy, our government is the band on board the Titanic. The full speech delivered by the leader of the Samagi Jana Balavegi, Andra Kumaru Desanayaka, will be broadcast on our sister channel, Sirusa TV, at 10.30 p.m. on Wednesday, the 25th of November. Here are some more views that were expressed in Parliament today. You are 6 percent per annum GDP growth projection for the next five years. Isn't this a pipe dream? 2021, in my view, is going to be a very stressful year. COVID-19 has impacted majority of businesses on all fronts. In my view, GDP growth in the short term will recover very slowly. Most of these businesses have been highly leveraged with bank debt and have not been servicing their debt since April 2019. In this backdrop, with no predictable revenues for the industry, until at least mid-2022, in late 2021, debt servicing will become a major challenge to all these businesses. Meanwhile, convening a media briefing, convener of the left centre, Shamira Pereira, expressed the following views. Minister Rauf Hakim was speaking about the economic growth in Parliament today. He said that this is not realistic. That is true. However, no matter what you say, you have to make sure that if you are against it, you should be able to speak up about it and stick to your stance. If someone is opposing this just for the show and supporting this in real life, they are traitors. COVID-19 has been a blessing for this government. Today we saw how high officials, including the head of the central bank, are undergoing self-quarantine. Although they claim that essential activities of the central bank are being carried out without a problem, a problem has arisen there. They are hiding behind these closures and COVID-19. The government likes to cover up things in the guise of COVID-19 
to carry out their activities. A group of members of the Yatinuara Pradesh Sabha protested against the demolition of a clock tower in Pilimathalava today. This clock tower was constructed in 1992 to commemorate the opening ceremony of a garment factory by late Ranasinghe Premadasa. Opposition members of the Yatinura Pradesh Sabha allege that it had been destroyed last night. Just because you got the power, don't abuse it. Restore this clock tower back to this location. We saw the destroyed King's Assembly Hall in Kurunagala. We would like to request the authorities that when given the power to protect them, don't turn these beautiful places into graveyards. News First inquired the chairman of the Urban Council, Amila Verogoda, regarding the incident. He said steps were taken to remove the clock tower to build a sidewalk and road signal towers based on urban development. The chairman further stated that the approval of all the members of the Municipal Council was obtained to make the decision. Up next is Action TV. The Chief Internal Auditor of the National Housing Development Authority has informed the Secretary of the Line Ministry that there is a risk of requiring legal action to be filed against the occupants of this plot of land located at Kirimandala Mavata in Narahempita in order for the National Housing Development Authority to acquire the plot of land as they are the legal owners of it. This was after an investigation was conducted into the manner in which this plot of land was leased out to a third party by the authority. Action TV revealed that this plot of land that spans across 5 acres and 10 perches was leased off without an estimate and outside the procurement procedure. When a 34 perch plot of land in Kolonava was leased out two years ago, the Government Valuation Department estimated the monthly installment of the lease at 4.15 million rupees. Two years after that, the monthly installment for the lease of this 5 acre and 10 purchase plot of land in Narahimpita was estimated at a meagre 100,000 rupees and the land was handed over to a third party for a commercial purpose. A security of 300,000 rupees was placed when the plot of land was leased out. The chairman of the National Housing Development Authority on the 6th of this month attempted to justify this transaction when he spoke to Action TV. The act confers powers for the lands of the authority to be used to generate revenue. Power has been vested to generate an income. Under those powers, the Board of Directors is given the authority to decide on these matters. There is an expense that must be incurred to provide security to this plot of land. That is the reason why the Board of Directors took this decision. The statement that this plot of land was leased out to cover up the expenses incurred for the protection of this plot of land is in itself baseless. When a third party is running a commercial venture on this plot of land, there is no requirement for the authority to incur expenses to provide security for it. What has happened in reality is that the plot of land has been leased out for a meagre sum of money and a higher cost has been incurred by the authority to provide security to this plot of land while the land was under the custody of a third party. The security company hired to protect the plot of land draws a sum of 475,000 rupees every month from the account of the National Housing Development Authority and not the party operating the commercial venture on this plot of land. The chief auditor of the authority has informed the secretary of the line ministry that there is no written agreement between the lessee, the housing development authority and the lessor the third party operating the commercial venture. Shouldn't the executive board of the National Housing Development Authority be sent home for their gross negligence and incompetence in undervaluing this plot of land and leasing it out for peanuts? Honorable Prime Minister, this is over to you. The government of the United Kingdom announced yesterday that passengers arriving in the UK 
from five countries, including Sri Lanka, will no longer have to undergo quarantine procedures upon arrival. Minister of Foreign Affairs Dinesh Gunawardena spoke about this in Parliament today. The High Commission said that these are non-exempt in countries are determined by the number of factors, number of factors, including latest epidemiological assessment. Now, the very important that we realize that our what we have progressed, what we have been doing is estimated by these countries and they have relaxed what Sri Lankans did not enjoy up to now. The foreign minister also spoke about the recent meetings with the ambassadors of Italy, Germany, Netherlands, France, Romania and the EU delegation based in Colombo. The EU delegation has their own problems and they understand our problems. They gave the assurance, I must say, that they will continue to help us and on the question of the GSP plus, the assurances were given. There are other matters that we have tried to resolve. I do not represent the automobile industry. I must say, the automobile industry is one area that has been affected. But do we immediately need the automobiles or do, do we immediately need investment? All the investment concessions have been granted for us to restart or reinvest in new areas. Technology, IT, that will cut down our unnecessary expenditures of our country from the government sector to the private sector. The wasteful expenditure will be reduced because of the IT sector and the new investment that will come. The Department of Meteorology warns the general public against engaging in fishing and naval activities in the deep and shallow waters of the north and east from tonight. The department notes that those who are currently fishing in these sea areas should immediately vacate either to a shore or to a safe place. The department further added that there will be showers exceeding 100 millimeters in some parts of the north, east and north central provinces from tomorrow. Moving on, in more local news, a COVID-19 relief program organized by the third region of the Lions Club International District 306 C1 was launched in Colombo yesterday. 300 families who have been quarantined will receive essential dry rations and food items through this program. The goods were handed over at premises of the Timirika CIA Divisional Secretariat. The dry rations and other items will be doled out to families undergoing home quarantine in Dematogoda and Kalipuliwatta with the intervention of the police. The Sri Lanka Army is also supporting this endeavour. 1,000 face masks and personal protective equipment were donated to the Sri Lanka police through the program. This initiative is funded through the personal wealth of members of the club. Wherever a lion is needed, a lion shall be present there. Staying true to that quote, the 306 C1 district of the International Lions Club launched a significant step in our program to assist the people who are battered by COVID-19. I would like to welcome all of you to today's program that was organized under the leadership of Heshan Padukka, who is the project chairman of the COVID-19 relief program. <laughs> The Lions Club is an organization that comprises people like you and I. Our personal wealth has been utilized for this social service. It is a difficult period for all of us. No one can ply their trade due to COVID-19. We believe it is our duty to extend our assistance to those who are less fortunate than all of us. Uh, From the massive COVID-19 outbreak to a turbulent presidential election marred with unfounded claims of water fraud, this has not been the best year for US President Donald Trump. To add to the list of unfortunate events, his oldest son has tested positive for COVID-19. 42-year-old Donald Trump Jr. was diagnosed at the start of this week and has been quarantining at his hunting cabin since the result. According to the statement, he is completely asymptomatic so far and is following all medically recommended COVID-19 guidelines. Donald Trump Jr. is the second of the president's children to test positive for the virus.
According to Johns Hopkins University, the U.S. COVID-19 case count is reaching towards 12 million, with the national death toll exceeding 254,000 today. The country now has the largest number of COVID-19 cases and death toll in the world. Donald Trump had fresh setback in his bid to overturn his loss in the U.S. election as Michigan lawmakers indicate that they would not seek to undo Joe Biden's projected win in the state. Earlier yesterday, Georgia dealt with U.S. President another blow by certifying Biden's razor-thin margin of victory. Biden's victory in the electoral college system, which determines who becomes the president, is projected to be 306 to 232, far above the 270 he needs to win. His lead in the public vote overall stands more than 5.9 million. A rocket attack on the Afghan capital Kabul has killed at least eight people and wounded 30 others just before scheduled U.S. Taliban talks. The explosion close to the diplomatic enclave sent warning sirens blaring from embassies and it came two days before a major donor conference from Afghanistan in Geneva. A spokesperson said that a group of individuals mounted the rockets in a small truck and sent them off, adding that the investigation is going on to find out how the vehicle came inside the city. US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is due to meet Taliban negotiators in Doha in an effort to resume peace talks. The Taliban fighting against a foreign back Kabul administration denied involvement in the attack. And that's a wrap of primetime news on TV1 for tonight. Of course, do stay safe, stay at home whenever possible and follow all health guidelines issued by the authorities. I'm Charlotte Benedict for the News First team along with our sign language interpreter for tonight, Taraka Gabriel, who under the current circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic in the country is joining us via Zoom. Until we meet tomorrow, take care and God bless.